Let's go back to the World Cup. It is a, a day off, but let's go to Sochi and join Irish journalist Brian McDonald, who's over there to talk to us a little bit about the, uh, the flowering of uh, Russian and international relations in the aftermath of Russia hosting the World Cup. Brian, good morning to you. How are you doing? Good morning, or double utra, as we say over here. Um, there's a load of stuff I want to talk to you about. Let's talk about football in Sochi first and what the level of expectation of the actual Russian public is before we get into uh, how the perception of the entire world seems to be changing on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, first off, do Russia think they're going to win this game against Croatia? Uh, not really, no. But then again, Russia didn't think they'd win any of their games. So, I mean, I think there's some kind of virtue and pessimism over here. Um, Sochi is, like, incredibly hot. We've been kind of seeing that so far. So, uh, what, like, is it the type of place where there will be, like, hundreds of thousands of people in the fan zone watching the game collectively? What will the actual experience be like for the Russians? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit bizarre because the, the weather is not actually good this week in Sochi. Last week we were hitting close to 40 degrees, but it's been, there's been no sunshine for the last couple of days. It's very humid and overcast. It, I, I think right now it's 24 degrees only, which is, it's actually warmer in Ireland than Sochi at the moment, basically, um, on average this week. As for the fan zone, it's it's a peculiar sort of thing. I mean, I've been in a few of the World Cup cities. I mean, Moscow is absolutely hopping. Um, you know, uh, Rostov and Don was actually amazing. I mean, for a city that used to be very dilapidated before, they've really done it up. The Sochi fan zone, Brazil are staying down here. It was very busy for the first couple of weeks. It's tailed off this week, and locals kind of think the Brazilians have run out of money, basically, because I, there's been reports of like that. Brazilians have been moving out of hotels into hostels. A few of them have been sleeping in the park and stuff because, you know, it's expensive here. And, um, I mean, a beer is six or seven euros. So, you know, for the Brazilians, it's quite expensive. The atmosphere is a bit weird this week again because we had a large contingent of Mexicans staying here and a large contingent of Ecuadorians, and they've all left. And the Russians haven't really arrived yet. And the Croatian representation here is very small. Okay, so it's kind of, it's actually that weird part of the tournament where, the World Cup kind of begins to feel like it's over and finishing. A lot of these cities, this is going to be the last game that they actually get to host in. So um, I, that definitely my memory of the World Cup in 2006 was that the group stages is the mad party that everybody has. And then after that, it's much smaller pockets as, as people just mm -hmm. go home. Yeah, and people run out of money, like I said. I mean, like, I mean, it's pretty expensive to keep going. Most people are on the lash every night for three or four weeks. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's only, it's only noticeable. Um, I think, you know, what's going on now is that because Russia are doing so well and because Sochi is what it is, you're, you're basically going to get a lot of really rich people coming down this weekend because black market tickets are going for three or four thousand euros at the moment right. um, and people are buying them. I mean, I, I've had a, I have, I've, I have two tickets. I've had a personal offer of two and a half grand for my two tickets, unsolicited, by the way, and obviously I'm not going to accept it. But um, you know, but that's just basically what's going on. So basically, you're getting your wealthy Moscow middle classes coming down here now, and uh, you know, the dynamic is very different. So we've moved from sort of having, you know, cheeky chappies from South America and lots and lots of fun to sort of here comes the guys in the Maybachs and the Rolls Royces, basically, you know, and it's kind of changing dramatically. As for your original question about. The Russians with the World Cup and how they feel about it. I mean, look, I just like to point out something. A lot of people like are saying, "Oh, they're on drugs, blah de blah." The Russian team is actually not that bad. I mean, they qualified for the last two major championships. They were hopeless in both finals, but the fact is, they did qualify. And if you look at like who they've beaten, I mean, they've beaten two very bad teams, Saudi Arabia and Egypt, maybe the two worst teams in the tournament along with Panama, and they've gotten lucky against a, a very disorganized Spain who fired their manager two days before the start and clearly weren't right. And look, at the end of the day, if Ireland were playing at home against Spain, we'd fancy our chances of getting a draw as well, you know, on any given day. So that's basically what Russia got, and they got lucky in the shootout. So the Russian public aren't kind of... Um they're enjoying this as a, a, a benefit, as, as um, kind of unexpected joy, as opposed to, uh, oh my God, we're suddenly world beaters. Yeah, I mean, they're under no illusions. I mean, like, I mean, I think Croatia are probably a little bit better organized than Spain. There's a couple of Croatian players have played in and out of the Russian league over the years. Like, I remember Pletlik Koza played for Lokomotiv Moscow a few years ago. So they're, they're probably pretty more familiar with the Croats in a way than they are with the Spanish. Um, you know, and I mean, they're also fellow Slavs and the mentality is quite similar. So I think they're probably more afraid of Croatia than they were of Spain. But look, you, your original point you raised me when we started was about perceptions of Russia. Yeah, let's talk about that. And this, this is very important because, you know, look, I'm, I'm not going to go on and on, but I came here eight years ago now. And when I came here, 
I had an incredibly negative attitude towards Russia. I mean, I, I would have been like, you know, uh, Putin runs the whole place. I mean, he's a very scary man. I don't want to spend too much time in that place, you know. Uh, the FSB, KGB, they used to be going to follow me around everywhere and bug my telephone. I really thought like that. I mean, because I grew up reading the British and American media like we all do in Ireland because we don't really have foreign correspondents in Ireland, as you know. Um, the Irish Times is a few, but like, you know, most of them aren't even Irish anyway, you know. Uh, so, so basically... The thing is like that, when I came here first, I, I was almost paranoid. I was, you know, bricking it. And slowly over a few months, my, my guard went down and, you know, and I, I got more into the place. And obviously I stayed for a long time. Um, Russians themselves, when they go abroad, the ones who can speak English or other languages, I mean, now, by the way, the German media are not so stereotypical about Russia as the British media, for example. I, I mean, but they're horrified by what they read. And if you ask any Russian person living in Dublin, maybe you should get one on. They're going to tell you that what they read and hear about their country in our media, the British media, has no reflection on the reality of life in Russia. Of course, Russia is by no means perfect. Of course, it's a soft authoritarian state. There's no doubt about that. But the idea like that people are living in fear or something or it's some kind of you know, brutal country is completely nonsense. And what the World Cup has done is it's allowed foreigners to come here and see it for themselves. And obviously, the reaction is very different than you know, what's usually said about the place. I mean, like, and if you look at the UK, for example, before the World Cup, the BBC ran what amounted to a defamation campaign against Russia, the Daily Mail, the Sun as well. I mean, I remember picking up the Daily Telegraph in an airport and I read a headline about canine KGB death squads that were going around, you know, <laughs> murdering dogs in cities. And I remember Edward Lucas of the London Times uh, telling the BBC that um, the, Russian, the Russians would probably give the English team drugs to slow them down. Well, he, sorry, yeah, you, you sent me that tweet um, from, from March. We just put it up there. Russia expert at Edward Lucas says it is not impossible for a Russian state to attack hashtag England team at the World Cup. This is Jeremy Vine tweeting this. For example, by administering a substance to slow them down while they play matches. Like, like alcohol, for example. But, um, you know, like the point is like that. I mean, and I have to say, like, that particular individual is often used by RTE as well as a Russia expert and as far as I'm aware he's not been in Russia for over a decade I mean like and you know and it's very frustrating for someone like me who's over here all the time I mean when you go home to Ireland and you hear people pontificating about Russia on the radio or television who've either never been here or maybe have been here once or twice in their lives and it's very frustrating and it's, it's the same as you would feel if you were over say in Australia and there was some guy ranting and raving about Ireland um and had never even been to the country and was calling us all leprechauns or pixies or something. I mean, and that's what it amounts to. And a lot of the and, and a lot of the chickens have come home to roost now because what's happened is that, you know, a lot people, media figures, public figures, whether it's Gary Neville, for example, or it's um, maybe journalists from England that don't usually cover Russia, soccer journalists or whatever, and they've kind of are tweeting and writing that it's been completely different to what they expected. And I mean, I think the British media needs to have a serious look at itself about that. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, by osmosis, or due to economic realities, we rely on the British media for our foreign coverage. I mean, almost all the Irish newspapers take their foreign coverage from the Daily Telegraph or the Guardian or whatever, so we, we get it that way as well. You know? But ultimately, though, Brian, I'm, I'm sure that there has been some sort of uh, cosmetics at play in Russia over the last couple of weeks. It is uh, a very planned, organized advertisement of the mm -hmm. country to the world. It would be stupid of the country not to clean up any negatives that they have going on. So I'm sure it's not the full real experience we're getting. That being said, uh, you're right. I mean, like uh, the, the things that we're seeing are, are largely positive. And of course, some of that is authentic, but it can't all be authentic, surely. No, but then again, I mean, how do you, like, for example, if you come here to, like, if you, I mentioned Rostov and Don earlier. I mean, it's a city I used to dislike passionately. It was a bit of a mess, to be honest with you. But there's two million people living there. How do you get two million people to kind of put on a, a fake face for three weeks? I mean, of course, there's an element of that. And there's going to be an element of that anywhere. I mean, when we had the Special Olympics in Ireland years ago, we tidied up our towns and we put out flower beds and we welcomed people and, you know, that wouldn't be the case all the time. Of course, that's true. And of course, there's a lot of very bad things about Russia. Russia is by no means a, a, a perfect or even great society. I'm just trying to make the point that it's not as bad as it has been made out to be. Um, and I absolutely accept your point. There's a huge element to that. Uh, let's talk negatives for a second. The police have been very relaxed. That's not the way the Russian police usually are. They're usually very heavy handed. There's no doubt about that. I mean, you know, there's people going around having selfies with cops and that. There are circumstances where if you did that, in other circumstances, they may 
you know, not, not smile with you, they may take you away somewhere. And that is true. So I absolutely take your point. But I'm just trying to make the point that, you know, life is like, there's no perfect society. Life is not perfect here, but it's not as bad as it was been made out to be. There was never that kind of danger. And the problem was that people like me, who were trying to say before the World Cup that, look, it's fine, come. We were being shouted down by the people saying that, you know, you're all going to get bludgeoned to death or something, you know? Yeah. I mean, look, I, <clears throat> so we've got John Duggan out there and he's having the time of his life and uh, is actually independently reporting pretty much all the same stuff that um, that you are uh, about what life is actually like there. And, and, you know, obviously he's having that World Cup experience, um, but has embedded himself with a, a bunch of Irish people who are, are out living there. And, like, I would, I didn't really want to go to the World Cup, I have to say, when um, this was all being talked about. Part of me was a little bit relieved we weren't all going to be decamping to Russia for six weeks uh, when Ireland didn't qualify. And now I'm really disappointed that that didn't happen and that we didn't get the opportunity to go out and see for ourselves with our own eyes exactly what life is like. And that's the stupidity. But sometimes you've got to chisel away at that. Um, look, um, I was kind of hoping for jocks or ghosts of Samara. It obviously didn't happen. I mean, you know, <laughs> but, but I mean, the point is like that. Look, I, 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 to explain it properly, I mean, like, the German World Cup experience in 2006 is a great example. I was at that, actually. And, you know, the, the, the Germans had a reputation for being stoic and unapproachable and severe and stern. And that World Cup kind of lifted that off them. Now, whether the same is going to happen to the Russians, I don't know. But I have to say, like, let's talk about Ireland, Ireland and Russia for a, for a moment. One of the most famous journalists here, Vladimir Posner, you may, do, do you remember Space Bridge in the 80s? No? Phil Donahue? Okay, so Posner used to present a show in the 80s in the States called Space Bridge. It was on NBC, and basically it was, uh, or CBS, one or the other. And it, the idea was that Phil Donahue was over in America, and Vladimir Posner was in Leningrad, as it was then, or whatever, or Gorky in the Soviet Union. And the idea was for ordinary Russians and Americans to ask each other questions. And Posner's a huge star here. He's kind of like Russia's gay burn, basically. And he's 84 years of age. And, you know, Posner has said frequently that he thinks the Irish are the most similar Westerners to the Russians. And one example, he said, they laugh, they cry, they're prone to bouts of melancholy, they drink too much, you know, they've got good writers. And it is true that Irish and Russians have a lot in common. And that's why it's an awful pity that the Irish didn't get to come over here. And, you know, I mean, Denmark weren't that great. We could have taken them. But, like, I, I, I obviously regret that deeply. And, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's sad, you know, but... I mean, your, your pinned tweet at the moment, um, we've had, you had your Twitter handle up there and people should go and check it out, is um, a blog post that you did about your journalism from your time in Ireland um, that you felt mm -hmm. you had to do because you were being accused of being a spy. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I guess you were being accused of being a spy on the back of writing stuff that wasn't incredibly critical of Russia. Look, at the end of the day... Um, I only came over here because of the recession in Ireland years ago. Lots of people left the country at the time. I mean, to go to wherever, Australia, Canada, America. I happened to come here, that's all. Um, <laughs> not, a, not a spy, anyway. I mean, the point is just that, like, look, I just came here. I, re I liked it. I mean, there's a lot of problems here. But the, the problem is, like, okay, let me explain. <clears throat> the British journalists who are based here, uh, one, one particular difference between Irish journalism and British journalism is that Almost all, not almost all, but the majority of Irish journalists have studied journalism at university. Would, would that be normal? I mean, most people have done communications in DCU or went to Rathmines College of Commerce or Ballyferm or whatever have you. That's not the case in Britain. If you, for example, I think eight of the 11 national newspaper editors in Britain went to Oxford, a university that doesn't even offer journalism. And almost all the Moscow correspondents in the British media have been to Oxford or Cambridge or Edinburgh, one of the elite universities. And um, my background is very different. I mean, I, I started working for the Evening Herald when I was 19 uh, via the weekender in Navan, actually, which where we're first gone now for a few months. Um, you know, it's a totally different background. I, I see myself as a journalist. I, I don't see myself as an ideologue. I don't have an ideology, to be honest with you. And I try to report facts. And as I see it, coverage of here is not being done in that manner. It's been done from ideological perspective, Cold War, Iron Curtain kind of mentality. And the, the British and American journalists here are using it as a, as a platform to eventually as a back door into a top job back home, basically. I mean, you do a couple of years in Moscow, you tow the party line, you go home, you get a nice position in London or Washington or New York or whatever. That's not an option for me. I'm Irish. I mean, no Irish newspaper 
it can afford to have a Moscow correspondent. Being here is not going to make me the editor of the Irish Times. <laughs> you know, so I just report it as I see it, and that's it. And unfortunately, because I'm not towing the Western Party line, I've had a lot of flack, yeah. And not just me. I mean, people, it's even worse for Americans like Stephen Cohen or, you know, guys like that who have literally had careers ruined and have been smeared left, right, and center for not being on message. And, you know, there's, yeah, it's pretty heavy, unfortunately. Yeah, That's how it is. The the Trump stuff must be particularly interesting then at this point in human history. That whole kind of uh, Trump as um, a Russian puppet and the allegations that uh, they have some kind of evidence of him doing some wrong in uh, in Moscow. What's that story being reported like, and what's it like to kind of watch that unfold from within Russia at the minute? Incredulity. I mean, like, I mean, look, twenty eleven. Do you remember the Bolotnia protests here in 2011? The, there was a huge thing uh, because basically Putin's United Russia Party had kind of riff, had kind of uh, you know messed with the ballot. Uh, they they you know it hadn't been a fair election. The point is that Putin was unable to fix his own election in 2011. I mean there was hundreds of thousands of people on the streets across Russia against it. And um, since then they've had to clean up the elections here. I mean, the last couple of elections have been much cleaner than before. The last one was probably the cleanest election in Russian history. Um, the guy is not able to, you know, as I said, uh, fix his own election successfully. The idea that he could go over to a, the most powerful country in the world and, and fix their election is ridiculous. I mean, as for election meddling, um, did Russia meddle in the election? Possibly. Yes, they did. But I, I would doubt that their meddling had much effect, to be honest with you. I mean, like, because uh, it was so crude. Um, the Russians would argue that the Americans have been interfering in their politics ever since the Soviet Union ended. I mean, a couple of examples. In 1993, when Boris Yeltsin um, literally shelled his own parliament, um, like literally fired tank rounds at his own parliament, the Duma, Bill Clinton described him as Russia's answer to Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> I mean, in 1996, American advisors helped Yeltsin to win the election, and they actually made a movie about it. The movie's called Spinning Boris, and um, it stars the guy from, I, I forget I forget his name, it'll come back to me. And they, um, they, you know, and even as recently as 2011, I mean, you've had American support for the Russian liberal opposition. Um, you know, you've had all that kind of thing going on. So the Russians would argue that you guys have been interfering in our elections for 27 years. And they would argue that if the, any meddling they did, well, how do you like those apples? That's what they would basically say. Yeah, and that's, so that's the way they would look. is that a topic of conversation amongst the Russians that you speak with? Though? Like, do they care about that kind of stuff? No, they don't. Absolutely not. I mean, you never hear anybody mentioning it. The only people that mention it are maybe journalists. Anyone outside of that bubble, they don't really care. I mean, if you turn around to the average Nikolai in the street or Sergei in the street and say that, they'll just laugh at you. I mean, like, because, I mean, they basically say to you that Putin's got enough of his own problems to be worrying about without worrying about that. Um, now, I would make a point, though. I, I don't want to come across. I want to try and make balance as I can. I would say that they did want Trump to win the election. Uh, not everybody. Some pe Russians I know preferred the idea of Clinton because she's more consistent. But of course, look, Hillary Clinton was basically advocating war with Russia, essentially, in Syria. I mean, she was essentially advocating that America escalates to such a degree that it would lead to confrontation. Trump was promising improved relations with Russia. So why would Russia, of course they'd want the guy asking for proved, improved relations to win. That's logical, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, one last point. The, the legacy for this World Cup, it seems from this part of the world, is going to be that um, we might think twice about being scared of going to Russia and uh, doing business with Russia and, um, and actually kind of having a, a mature... 21st century relationship with Russia as opposed to one based on the cartoonish reporting that we've seen? Yeah, I mean, look, that's what I'd like to see. I mean, like, as I said to you already, I find it very frustrating. Like, for example, you're talking about Twitter. Sometimes I will write something on Twitter and some Irish journalists will write back stuff like, ah, that's because of your guy, your man or something. I say, who's your man? They will say, Putin, a guy who I've never met in my life, for example. Um, you know, um, sorry, I tell a lie. I, I did meet him once years ago, um, but not, we didn't have chat or anything, just shaking hands, you know. Um, but the point is, anyway, that, um, like, and the, the journalist in particular I'm referring to there has never been to Russia. I know that because I asked him. There is a stereotype out there. It's very frustrating. One hopes that the World Cup will go some way to mending that. But it doesn't just exist in journalism, Jer. It exists in 
with politicians. Now, there are exceptions. I mean, I know a number of Fine Gael TDs who, are, who have asked me for advice about Russia over the years, and, and they're very open-minded about the country. But I've also encountered Irish politicians who will say the most bizarre things about Russia and, you know, the most bizarre stereotypes and you can't do business with those guys and blah, blah, blah. So it cuts both ways. I do think the Irish are more open-minded than the British, though. I've always thought that. I do think the Irish are sceptical, a more sceptical people. They don't buy everything they're told. Um, I find the British to be much more naive than the Irish, for example, when it comes to stuff like that. I think our people are a bit smarter. Uh, sorry, just one final point for me, Brian. Do you think Theresa May is going to accept the renewed invitation to come to the World Cup? Oh, this is a funny one. They never invited her, by the way. Okay. That's, I, I actually, I, I read that in a Russian newspaper yesterday. I think it was Commerçant. Uh, they said that they actually issued no formal invitations to any British dignitaries. They, th that's not how they operate on diplomatic protocol. The British kind of, in other words, they're saying everybody is welcome. There were no specific invitations. And if the British want to send a VIP, they have to notify the Russians, you know, through the relative channels. So the Guardian report that they renewed their invitation is not true. They actually never issued one in the first place. Right. So it's, it's basically if Theresa May wants to come, she's welcome. But there's, there's, they didn't specifically say, hey, Theresa or Mrs. May, we, we invite you. They didn't do that. Brian, good stuff. Thanks for joining us this morning. No problem.